Welcome to the uh, next lecture in the Cold War. This is about the Red Scare. And remember, we used to have a Red Scare. We did have a Red Scare in the 1920s. This one has some different facts, but basically it's the fear that Americans had of communism. So <clears throat> after the 1920s, and remember the 1920s, there was a time where we were afraid of radical ideas. And this was uh, uh, communists. It was... Um, there was another group that was against all government, um, so anarchists, and they were coming from Eastern Europe, and so it also led to an anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, and those were all things we studied in the 1920s. Well, and then the Great Depression hit, and the Great Depression, <clears throat> Americans were suffering financially, and they're going, well, who's going to fix this? And remember, during the the 30s, at least at the beginning, um, the president basically said, you know, we will fix this ourselves, uh, just leave the economy alone. Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran for president and said, no, we can, we actually will need to fix this. And uh, so it took a while for this all to roll out from the crash of 1929 until Roosevelt gets elected in 1932. And it takes a little while for Roosevelt's programs to actually take effect. And so there's a lot of people in America with a lot of uh, economic insecurity. And they're going, wait a minute, this isn't working right. And communism offered some chance or some hope. It's like, wait a minute, there's a different kind of an economic system. And a lot of Americans looked at the communist ideal, ideology and said, you know, we think this would be a good thing. And so... They didn't try and overthrow the government. They just tried to, they started a, a communist party, an American communist party, and they felt like they could vote, enough people would, in, uh, would support this idea, that they would vote for this, <clears throat> and then eventually America could become communist, and that would fix the economic problems. At least that's what they thought. So anyways, they joined the communist party. Um, but then, you know, what happened was, World War II, and World War II uh, really, you know, there was a first New Deal and then the second New Deal, and all of those things did help some, but they didn't bring America back to where it was, but World War II did. Uh, we created an economy during the war that was just, uh, there was no unemployment, there was no problems with being able to make your payments, and and that kind of stuff. We were all focused and concentrating on fighting this war. And so most Americans kind of forgot about communism. Plus we watched what Stalin did with Hitler and we didn't like that. And so that became, communism became even less popular. Um, so the communist ideology sort of faded out uh, during the 1940s. Well, um, now we're out of World War II and um, what we knew of communism, we didn't like. We didn't like Stalin. And now he's threatening or promising to take over the world with communism. So there was a lot of intense anti-communist feelings in America. And that led to a crusade to find communists. That is, we thought the communists were still here. They were still underground now. Um, and we were trying to find out where they were because the communist threat was they were going to take over the world and, you know, that includes America. So we were trying to find out where they were and how they were trying to destroy our society. In trying to find out this information, where are the communists hiding? A lot of people had their civil rights violated. You know, you have a right to privacy, you have a right to your own religious beliefs, you have a right to there's a lot of rights built into the Constitution and that our government is founded upon. <clears throat> and it, it makes it hard for the government to find out information if they're not allowed to uh, look into your private life and those kinds of things. Um, it's free speech, the ability to say, hey, this is my idea. It's not a popular idea. Maybe you don't like that idea, but I have the right to say it. Well, the government 
had a vested interest in stopping communism, and so they tried to stop some free speech. So privacy, free speech, all of those kinds of things. And you can see here in the cartoon, uh, if you look on the, car, the, the, the person's leg, it says hysteria. We're so hysterical, she, uh, he's carrying a bucket of water up to douse the flame of liberty. That's the, you know, the Statue of Liberty there. That's the top, and that's the flame of liberty. So it's like we're so hysterical, we're so afraid, we're willing to even give up our freedom and our, um, our rights in order to calm the hysteria. So that was uh, kind of what the Red Scare did. It was a, a fear of communism that, that led the American government and people in America to be so anti-communist that they were willing to tread on people, to trample on people's civil rights in order to stamp it out. <clears throat> so these are some of the things that Truman did. Um, in 1947, he established um, a program called the Federal Loyalty Program. So uh, if you work for the federal government or if you applied to work for the federal government, the FBI would check out your past to make sure that you were not a hidden or a secret communist and actually trying to infiltrate. One of the biggest things they were worried about was schools. Because remember communism, the idea is you teach this to children and as they grow up they become true communists. So. Uh, we were worried about propaganda in the schools. We were worried about uh, people working in the government that would be pro-communist and that kind of stuff. Um, in the Congress, so the, the president did the loyalty program, but Congress created a committee. It's usually called HUAC, but it's uh, short for House Un-American Activities Committee. And so they were... They were trying to find out, so where might we find communists? And so when, uh, when Congress holds a committee, they actually have the right to subpoena witnesses. That means you have to come testify if they ask you to. It's like being going to court. You don't actually have the right to go, no, I don't think I will. You have to go. Otherwise, you could be held in contempt of court and actually arrested. So Congress puts together this committee to look for communists, to see where they are and uh, try and find out. And a lot of people were worried about Hollywood. You know, uh, media, movies, all that kind of stuff is one of the ways, one of the big ways that Americans learn what Americans are like. It's what, what is life like? Well, we watch shows, we watch movies. And, and the fear was that there were a lot of communists in Hollywood and they were putting communist propaganda uh, pro-communist messages into movies and shows and that kind of stuff. And so Congress thought, you know, uh, we better check into those people because they have a really big voice with Americans and nobody's telling them what they can and can't say and we don't know if they're communists. We would like to know. So they called a lot of actors, directors, writers to 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 say, hey, do you know of anybody that's a communist? Are you a communist? Uh, what might show? What shows might be leaning that way? And so um, they called them to testify. There were actually ten people. These ten guys. They're called the Hollywood Ten uh, after this episode, but they refused to testify, not because they were communist, although some of them might have been. I don't know. Um, whether they were communist or not, that's not why they said they weren't going to testify. What they said is, this is not the way America works. America, uh, we have the right to presumption of innocence. We have the right to remain silent. Even if we haven't been charged with a crime, we don't have to talk to you. And we think what you're doing is un-American, not what what a communist might be saying or teaching or, or doing, uh, that's not illegal in America. It's not illegal to think communist. It's not illegal in America to think anything, right? We don't publish, uh, or we don't punish thought. You have the freedom of thought, freedom of religion, 
freedom of speech. All of those ideas are based on, it doesn't matter how crazy, you might not like racist talk, but it's not illegal to talk like a racist. And it is illegal to act racist, right? So once your, once your ideas in your mouth become actions, then we go, okay, that's it, can't do that, right? But it is not illegal unless you say something that's, um, you know, when we get to freedom of speech, remember the uh, baseline is clear and present danger. So if you do provocative speech in a crowd or in, a, in, a, in the middle of a problem and it causes a riot, they would say you didn't have the right to do that. Um, so sometimes spe speech is curtailed, but usually not in this sense. They're not actually trying to produce a riot. They're just standing up and going, look, you don't have the right to subpoena us and demand that we testify uh, about our own private lives, about our own private companies, and what we think politically. That's not the way America works. And so they refused to testify. Well, <clears throat> what happened is they were held in contempt of court or contempt of Congress, and so they were sent to jail. That's what happens when you're subpoenaed to witness and you refuse to testify. You don't actually have the right to do that, and so they were put in jail. And uh, this caused a big stir um, across the country. First of all, people go out, well, hey, if they don't want to say something, they must be guilty, which is, um, you know, it's sort of a natural reaction. But you have to be really careful because in America, you know what? You're innocent until you're proven guilty. So you have to presume their innocence. It's hard to do. It's hard to do with any of these kinds of things. When you hear something, you go, oh, well, they must have done this. That's not the way America works. It's not the way our court systems work. It's not the way our Congress works. And it's not what the Constitution says America is. So these guys went to jail on the principle that we shouldn't have to talk because that's an un-American idea. A lot of people in, out in the population felt that just proved that they were guilty. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so... They continued to make all kinds of investigations into movie studios and television was just starting to come online and radio shows and any, any kind of media that would present this stuff. And so if you wanted to stay in business or if you didn't want to be tainted as, well, they might be communist, what happened is they stopped dealing or working with people that somebody said, oh, so those the Hollywood 10, when they got out of, of jail, guess what? They had a hard time getting somebody to, to work with. Nobody wanted to be connected with a communist because that would be dangerous. That led to a thing called the blacklist or a blacklist. And a blacklist wasn't a real list. It wasn't written down on a piece of paper. It was the idea that these people were not invited to any groups. So if you look at the headline there, Lucy Ball in red ink. So here's the thing, I Love Lucy was a really popular show in the 1950s. And, and people that loved that, but people said, oh, she might be communist, why? Well, she's married to a Cuban, right? So her husband was from, he was an immigrant from a communist country. And it was like, this is like, this is all the evidence it took. So now Lucille Ball has a hard time getting a job because somebody thought she might be connected with communism. And the studios didn't want anything to do with people like that. And so this blacklist, which was informal, it was kind of like, well, you know, so-and-so, don't get them around. But nobody ever wrote it down. Nobody ever said, you can't do it. It just, it just happened. So this blacklist spread and uh, hurt a lot of people's careers because they just couldn't get work. Um, all right. Ten were imprisoned. With hundreds more, they were blacklisted. Their livelihood... Until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness. If it were in my power to forgive you for your reckless cruelty, I would do so. I like to think I'm a gentleman, but your forgiveness will have to come from 
from someone other than me. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, may, may I say that uh, Mr. Wells talks about this being cruel and reckless. He was just baiting. He has been baiting. Senator, may we not drop this? Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. This, I know this hurts you, Mr. Wells. I'll but say it hurts. I say, Mr. Chairman, Mr. as a point of personal uh, privilege, Mr. I'd like to finish this. Senator, I think it hurts you too, I'd, sir. I'd like to finish this. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wells here has been filibustering this hearing. He's been talking day after day about the way he wants to get anyone tainted with communism out before sundown. Mr. McCarthy, I will not discuss it further. I will not ask Mr. Cohen any more witnesses. You, Mr. Chairman, may, if you will, call the next witness. Are there any questions to come from the uh, All right, so you were hearing um, what was going on in Congress <clears throat> at this time, and we will return and talk more about Joe McCarthy. He was the guy you were listening to there right at the end. Um, Joe McCarthy is a very famous, uh, or I should say infamous, senator who you saw at the end of that video was censured for his antics in the Senate and going after communists. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, there were a couple of famous spy cases, uh, the first of them, and this is one of the ones that Joe McCarthy uh, referred to, was Alger Hiss, who was, um, had been a part of the State Department. Remember, the State Department deals with foreign countries on behalf of the United States. He was accused of being a spy during during the 1930s. Of course, this doesn't happen until after World War II, so it's in the 1940s and 50s where this actually happens. But it's about what he was back in the 30s. So because we were so anti-communist in our views, it didn't matter when you did it, even if it was 20 years ago. So Alger Hiss uh, takes a lot of heat for what he was in the 1930s, even though it's the 1950s. He did testify to that committee, to HUAC, and um, he was found guilty of perjury. And he wasn't found guilty of, um, of, of uh, what do you call it, it's, um, going against the United States. He was found guilty because he actually gave, four, uh, he gave some answers that were not truthful. And for that, um, he was branded a spy, a liar, and he was sentenced to four years in prison for doing that. So, um, he, we don't know if he was a spy. Um, we still don't, as far as I know. I, I haven't done that much investigation. Uh, but it wasn't clear if he was a spy, and that's not what he was convicted of. He was actually convicted of perjury. Um, so anyways, that's what happened with Alger Hiss. In 1948, the... There was another one. Um, well, let's see what this has to say. In 1948, the Red Hunt struck at the very center of government when ex-communist Whitaker Chambers accused a former State Department employee named Alger Hiss of spying for the Soviet Union. I first knew him as Crosby. What his name is today, I am not prepared to testify to, or what other names he may have had. Mr. Hiss represents the concealed enemy against which we are all fighting and I am fighting. The House Committee was prepared to dismiss the case for lack of conclusive evidence, but one of its members pressed the issue an ambitious young congressman from California, Richard Nixon. These documents were fed out of the State Department over 10 years ago 
by communists who were employees of that department and who were interested in seeing if these documents were sent to the Soviet Union, where the interests of the Soviet Union happened to be in conflict with those of the United States. Elger Hiss was convicted, not of treason, but of perjury, and sentenced to five years in prison. His supporters said he was a victim of the communist hysteria. Others saw him as part of a communist conspiracy to destroy the United States and press the search for more traitors. Within months, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were arrested in connection with a plot to pass U.S. bomb secrets to the Soviets. The Rosenbergs denied the charges and claimed they were being persecuted as Jews and for their left-wing views. The evidence suggested they played a small but material role in the spy ring. The Rosenbergs were convicted and sentenced to die in the electric chair. Protests erupted amid claims of anti-Semitism. The Nobel Prize winning writer Jean-Paul Sartre condemned the sentence as a legal lynching which smears with blood a whole nation. He warned, your country is sick with fear. You are afraid of the shadow, your own bomb. Despite the outcry, the Rosenbergs were executed in 1953. In my so uh, Alger Hiss is one example, and the Rosenbergs are another of uh, this red scare, the hysteria people were afraid of. So they were accused of passing, remember the uh, Soviets got the atomic bomb only a few years after World War II. And uh, they were spying, they were getting information, and like the short little video said, there was some evidence that they might have been involved, but there was uh, not hard proof. And so when there's hysteria, when America wants somebody to pay, then a lot of times it doesn't have to be uh, ironclad proof. There doesn't have to be that. They just accept, okay, well, they must have been guilty. Uh, there's a lot of stories that go along with Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, and studies have been done on uh, Soviet documents after the fall of the, the Soviet Empire and in the 1990s. And uh, so there seems to be more evidence that they actually were um, complicit and guilty, but we didn't know that at the time, and it didn't really matter. They were both uh, convicted and uh, executed in the electric chair in 1953. A lot of people thought they were innocent. A lot of people said, well, they may not be innocent, but we don't have enough proof. It's not a good idea to execute somebody unless you have absolutely ironclad proof. And so there were a lot of protests about the Rosenbergs and their, <clears throat> their execution. Um, we already talked a little bit, or at least the video did, about Joe McCarthy. Here's a picture of him. And he was a Republican senator from Wisconsin. And, and so he actually created a stage. Um, so because America was anti-communist, he picked up this theme and uh, he gave a speech in Congress, in front of Congress. Remember, HUAC was there, and, and uh, they were trying to find out who was communist. And Joe McCarthy stood up in front of Congress, and he held up this list, and he said, Look it, I have the name of 205 communists that work in the State Department. That means they're working with other countries around the world. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, that shocked people. And uh, they kept saying, well, who's on the list? Who's on the list? He goes, well, I'm not prepared to say yet, but I will, I will show this list to you uh, eventually, but not yet. And so he sort of set up this, like, drama where he was the center of the whole thing. Um, and that's actually what happened in the long run. People began to understand that he was just creating this crisis so he could be the savior. He's the one who had the information. He had the power. Everybody was listening to him. And that's sort of how he arranged it. Uh, in the midst of this communist scare, he was able to manipulate Congress. He was able to manipulate the American people. And uh, eventually, it, it comes out. 
and it destroys him and uh, this, it destroys the whole, um, what would you call it, the foundation of this anti-communist movement. People began to see, hey, we are so terrified of this, we need to be more careful. So let's back off a little bit. And so actually, you know, McCarthy, in some sense, showed America in a, in a like a mirror, we showed them, put the mirror up to the face of America and said, this is what your fear is doing to us. He didn't believe it that way, but that's what we began to understand. Who was on the list? Nobody. It was completely a lie. He didn't have a list. There weren't 205 communists in the State Department. He just wanted more fear because more fear would give him more power. He started accusing people in the army of being communists. He started, I mean, the, the, out, the accusations got so outrageous that people started going, wait a minute, you're not giving us facts, you're just making, you're just making it a bigger and bigger problem. And uh, so they started to actually question him. And uh, of course, that didn't go over very well. This whole era became known as McCarthyism. And Senator McCarthy was the McCarthy of McCarthyism. We still use McCarthyism today. And it's the belief where you think there's an enemy out there. You don't have evidence, but you kind of think it might be. And that's all you need. And you're ready to prosecute. You're ready to convict. You're ready to execute without evidence. So, and there's a communist under every rock. And there's some... They're, they're all hiding, and there's this paranoia that comes along with it. So McCarthyism is a, a good word that you should learn the background and meaning of it, because it's still used today. They use it in a different sense. They might talk about it in a political argument right now in Congress, and they go, well, that's McCarthy. Uh, that's McCarthyism. They're not talking about communism necessarily, but they're talking about the willingness um, for people to go farther than they should without facts and believe what they're afraid of. Driven by fear, you will believe things that aren't true. Kind of like what the fake news is doing today from every side because we don't like the other side or we're afraid of the other side. And so all, it, all somebody has to do is say something that you sort of agree with and you go, aha, see, you guys, that's the way it is. That's a McCarthyistic sort of idea or the way it works out. So it's really valuable to see this happen in history. It's more valuable if you can identify it happening today. So, and this is, um, this is what's fun about history is you can see it and you go, ah, oh, look at that. Look at how America reacted. And then when you see reactions like that, then you kind of, your little ideas in your head should go, Bum. hey, wait. Do they really know this? Or is it just the fear of the people that are jumping to conclusions? So that's probably the most valuable uh, thing that we have from this. It is interesting. There's a ton of stories about the McCarthy era and um, what happened and why it happened. And even the people that use information from the McCarthy era are still using it uh, to make their points. So that's really important era and part of the... Um, this whole red scare. Uh, as I told you, he told, said the army was full of a bunch of communists. And that was the thing that Congress started investigating him and his claims. And that was, uh, we actually watched this. By now, television was available in a lot of homes. They televised these hearings on television. So Americans began to see the phony, flimsy nature of what McCarthy was saying and his evidence wasn't really there and and uh, he became unpopular. So he's an infamous character. That means he's famous for doing not good things. It's, you want to be famous. Famous means you're known for doing good. Infamous means you're known for doing bad. And that's what McCarthy was. So all of these hearings, he got uh, he got grilled, and he he you saw a little bit of that in the video. Um, he didn't look strong. He looked like uh, he had weak arguments and faulty logic, and probably a lot of prejudice involved in there as well. So, anyways, 
almost everybody lost support for he lost almost everybody's support uh, you know that he was censured by Congress which is the strongest thing they can do besides kicking you out um, he actually died um, out of politics uh, unliked by the American people uh, alcoholic and pretty much a miserable end to a life so that's it for the uh, the Red Scare. Hope to give you an idea of the political fear factor that was going on that, because we were so afraid of the communists. All right. Well, uh, we'll call that a day and uh, hope you enjoyed the lecture.